Portsmouth in December of 1774. He warned that the British were coming to New Hampshire to remove the cannon and gunpowder stored at Fort William and Mary. The next day, John Wayne had led nearly 400 armed men and boys to the fort and demanded the arsenal be turned over to them. The fort's five-man garrison, commanded by Captain Cochran, was quickly overwhelmed, and over the next two days, the New Hampshire militiamen took 16 white cannons and 97 barrels of gunpowder from the fort. I did all in my power to defend the fort, but all efforts could not avail against so great a number. Captain Cochran, Commander, Fort William and Mary. Although no one was killed or wounded, the raid on Fort William and Mary could be considered the first armed conflict of the Revolutionary War. It was the only military action of the war to take place on New Hampshire soil. Few New Hampshire men played a more important role in the Revolutionary War than John Langdon. In addition to leading the raid on Fort William and Mary, Langdon's successful career as a sea captain and merchant led to his appointment by the Continental Congress to the committee overseeing the development of the United States Navy. As Marine agent from New Hampshire, Langdon established a shipyard in Portsmouth that built the warships Raleigh, Ranger, and America. Much of Langdon's personal wealth went to the support and equipping of New Hampshire's militiamen. If we defend our homes and our firesides, I may get my pay. If we do not defend them, the property will be of no value to me. John Langdon, shipbuilder and patriot. What happened to the cannon and gunpowder taken from Fort William and Mary? Some of the powder is believed to have been used at the Battle of Bunker Hill. New Hampshire contributed two regiments to that famed battle in which the British, although winning the field at the end of the day, lost twice as many men as the Patriots. More New Hampshire men fought there on that June day than Massachusetts and Connecticut combined. As a regiment commanded by Colonel John Stark marched towards its assigned place on that day of battle, Captain Henry Dearborn, one of the company commanders, asked the colonel if they shouldn't quicken the pace. Stark's reply set the tone for his men's heroics of that day. Dearborn, one fresh man in action is worth ten fatigue ones. And so it proved to me. On the morning of April 19, 1775, three brothers from the town of Hollis were digging stones for a wall. The brothers had partially raised a large stone and wedged a smaller stone under it when a horseman galloped into view. The breathless rider told them British troops were advancing towards Lexington and Concord. All Hollis militiamen were to report to the town common. And even they were just as it was, the three brothers ran for their muskets and knapsacks and hurried to join the militia. One of those brothers was killed at Bunker Hill, and another died a year later in New York. For over 75 years, the large stone, with the smaller one supporting it, was left in place, just as the brothers had left it. It was a memorial to the brothers who never hesitated to take up arms to defend their country. John Stark's resourcefulness as a battlefield commander was hard-earned through life experience. Captured by Indians as a young man, he won the admiration by his toughness and audacity, especially when he was forced to run the gauntlet. He attacked the first warrior, took his weapon, and fought his way through, rather than submit to the beating. Later, he served with Rogers Rangers, where he learned how to fight guerrilla style, a skill that served him well during the Revolutionary War. Stark was so highly respected as a New Hampshire hero that in 1894, he was a logical choice, along with Daniel Webster, to be the two New Hampshire heroes whose statues are in the Capitol in Washington, D.C.
Of all the heroes at Bunker Hill, New Hampshire's John Stark was one of the most resourceful and successful battlefield commanders. Stark also distinguished himself at the Battle of Bennington in August of 1777. On that day, his army of more than 2,000 militiamen, along with Vermont's famed Green Mountain Boys, played a key role in slowing the British advance from Canada. Now, my men, yonder are the Hessians. They were bought for seven pounds, ten pence a man. Are you worth more? Well, yeah, prove it. Tonight, the American flag floats over yonder hill, or my stock sleeps a winner. Stark's troops defeated the Hessian company sent to Bennington by British General Burgoyne to get fresh horses, food, and supplies. It was the first American victory in a long time, and set the stage for the defeat of Burgoyne's main forces at Saratoga, considered one of the turning points of America's war for independence. General John Stark, New Hampshire hero of the American Revolution, is still very much a part of New Hampshire today. He wrote the words that became our state motto and our honor license plates, live free or die. In 1809, when John Stark was 81 years old, he was invited by the citizens of Bennington, Vermont, to attend a celebration commemorating the battle he had won. Stark, weak with the infirmities of age, was unable to attend. He wrote a letter to this effect, signed it, and then added a postscript. I'll give you my volunteer toast. Live free or die. Death is not the worst of evils. From July to November 1777, John Paul Jones stayed in the boarding house on State Street in Portsmouth while he supervised the final fitting out of his ship, the Ranger, at John Langdon's shipyard. Today the house is the home of the Portsmouth Historical Society. Jones was a proud man, always seeking recognition and glory, and quick to take offense at any perceived slight. Before he sailed the Ranger into the harbor of Quiberon Bay, France, Joan used diplomatic correspondence to arrange the gun salute that were to take place. Although Jones felt the French Admiral Nine-Gun Salute was somewhat insulting to his personal rank, it did mark the first time a foreign country recognized the official flag of the new nation, the United States of America. Great, we have to set the type up one little letter at a time, independently, to make a word properly spelled, and then we put them up together and we make a sentence properly spaced and properly punctuated. And we have to do this as a mirrored image. So that means upside down or backwards. It means I've got to be able to read what I print upside down. And I also have to be able to, work, to spell words upside down or backwards in order to set them up right. Upside down or backwards. Lousy job. Now, any, any questions? Thank you. Well, make sure you take a copy of the indenture and take five dollars. That's the easiest five dollars you'll ever make. It's only good in 1776. Not good today. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Portsmouth. Where are you from? Where are you from? Where are you from? Buffalo, New York. Buffalo, New York. Very good. We got somebody, somebody from out of the, out of the, out of New England, I should say. My goodness. Well, good morning. I'd like to talk to you about this press we have here. The press we have is called a common press or a two-step press. It's an exact copy of the one that's in the Smithsonian Institute, which was operated by Benjamin Franklin in 1725. It'll been one copy at a time. What I'm printing this morning is two things. I'm printing four or five dollar script notes for the colony of New Hampshire, and I'm printing a, a copy of indenture. 
Now they script notes in, in New Hampshire were five dollars. Every colony, all thirteen colonies, put in their own money. They all printed script for their colony. So they, they had their own treasury. They had no national treasury at the time. And most of the script notes was printed in denominations of English denominations, Tom Sterling. But in New Hampshire we did print our, no, our notes in, in dollars. We were one of the first colonies to print in dollars. Now, the, the indenture notice. If you want to learn a trade in the 1700s, there were no trade schools. You'd have to go out to a master of the trade and ask him to apprentice. And he would give you a copy of the indenture and tell you to sign it. This indenture is like a military contract, which means that once you sign the document, you can't leave, you can't get married, you can't drink alcoholic beverages, you cannot gamble, and all kinds of things you can't do. And of course, as it's signed by the magistrate, if you break any of the rules, you know what happens? You go to jail. Uh -huh. Just like a military kind of. Same thing. <coughs> now, I'd like to show you how we... How Benjamin Franklin started out in the... Put the paper in the, to the printing. The paper in for the things that are printing. Wow. Close up the frisket. Every copy we do is to be ink. The ink is made out of linseed oil, lamp black, and varnish. <coughs> this particular mixture will not come out of your clothes. So we have to wear black sleeves and a black leather ink. Now what I'm making, what is it called? Ink ball. These are leather covers. Leather covers filled with lamb's wool for resiliency. We use these to ink the metal type. A metal type will not hold ink by itself, which means I have to ink every time I print. If I fail to ink the type, I will not get a copy. Get a copy of what I eat. Close up the press. And run it in. Mm -hmm. We'll do step two, which is the high five dollar script notes. Mm -hmm. Open up the press <coughs> and take out the copy. Now let's copy. The copies are wet ink. If I touch them with a smear, it takes approximately two days to dry. And if we have to hang these on lines, the lines are called fly lines. And when we hang these, we call them flyers. So the word flyer came from the print shop. Now, meantime, we'll put them between sheets of paper for now. Later on, we'll put them. Hang them up. Now you're aware of uppercase letters and lowercase letters, I'm sure. Well, that came from the print shop. Here we have sets of type called sorts. No way, you ever been out of sorts? Yeah. Well, the type, the type center can't be out of sorts. He's out of sorts, he's out of type. No, I can't be out of sorts. Now, on the top there we have the uppercase of sorts, and below it we have the lowercase of sorts. Uppercase, lowercase, no, it's not easy. Uppercase and lowercase. That's why today you call it uppercase and lowercase. Isn't that easy? Any questions? No, very interesting. Very interesting. Right. And I won't say. Yeah, right. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Hi there. Hi. How many copies could you print in an hour? I don't know. We 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 uh, we, we tried. Uh, I guess we we tried at one time. Two people were running uh, running it. Uh, we tried to print what was called a token. The token quantity is 240 sheets of paper. Mm -hmm. And we found out that uh, we couldn't print 240 sheets in an hour. It was a little bit much more than we could do. But they claim the old time printers used to be able to print a token by a token an hour, 240 sheets of paper. That is really, really working hard. Need a lot of space to dry it too. Pardon? Need a lot of space to dry it. Oh yeah, yeah, that's the other problem of drying. Mm -hmm. Right. <coughs> but a good printer could print several tokens a day. Back in the 1700s. They made out of oak. It's, uh, it's uh, Connecticut oak. Originally, it was made out of uh, English oak. They. Uh, <coughs> This is African mahogany. Very hardwood. Well, the, the, we, we try to use hard maple, it doesn't work. No. Oh. Because uh, hard maple had an affinity to water. It would work. Mm -hmm. Hi, Hi, where are you from? Oh, Farmington, New Hampshire, just by Farmington, very yeah. good. Come right on in. We'll talk to you in a second. This is, the, so we had to change this from, from hard maple to African mahogany. African mahogany has the least affinity for water of any any known wood. And it will not work, or it does not work anyhow. We haven't any trouble with it at all. But the one with maple used to work so we wouldn't get a good print. And we had to keep taking it apart and re-sanding it flat mm. to keep it printing. And it wasn't working very well. So we changed this over to African mahogany to correct the problem. The original one in in uh, Smithsonian Institute it made out was made out of African mahogany too. That's why we got the idea of using African <laughs> mahogany. Well, good afternoon. Good morning, I should say. Where are you from? Farmington. Farmington. Oh, that's right. You're from Farmington. We come up every so often. You come up every so often. Yeah. Well, I'd like to talk to you about the press we have. The press we have here is called the Common Press or a two-step press. It's an exact copy <coughs> of the one that's in the Smithsonian Institute, which was operated by Benjamin Franklin in 1725. You'll print one copy at a time. Where are one of their letters backwards, like it looks like an F, but it's an, actually an S? That's a long S. Yes. It's a long S. That's a script S. Mm -hmm. Came out of the on a German script originally, and we don't know why. We have no idea why they use that. But if you look at the, this here, you see what we have with it. Can you read this? Selfishness. Selfishness. And that's the long S. Yeah. It's called the long S. It's a capital S, uppercase S. Or lowercase s, and this is a lowercase s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I heard that, and it was like, oh. And then until about 1800s, they they used the long s. The long s, okay. And where you'll find that every everything that we've printed is a long s. Okay, turn to the right. 